Ahoy, mateys! Roger says, hey. Roger, where's your navy hat? You're supposed to have one on. All right, we'll have to get one issued. All right, so I have an army uniform. I have a uh, little flight jacket for the Air Force stuff. So you gotta have something for the Navy, right? Especially since my grandfather served in the Navy during the Korean War. This is not his uniform, by the way. Although I wish it was, that would be kind of cool. I am a, uh, have no idea what that rank <laughs> is. Is that an ensign? And uh, this, uh, well, the person that used to wear this is, uh, she, they served on the USS Sturgeon. All right, so this video that we're gonna be doing today is a Mark Felton uh, video. This was recommended to me uh, from one of my patrons, Stephen Parker. Hi, Scarlet. Scarlet's trying to mutiny people. This was recommended to me by one of my patrons, Stephen Parker, and he said, when watching the World at War in the North Atlantic, we saw briefly how U-boats approached very near to the U.S. coast. This gives a bit more detail. It's only just over 11 minutes long. It's by Mark Felton, the Manhattan U-boat German submarine, New York City. I think this is a really interesting thing because I think there's a misconception that the U.S. itself wasn't really in too much of a danger from World War II since we were like on the other side of the world from everything with the exception of you know the territory of Hawaii which obviously was bombed by the Japanese. What I'm talking about is like the mainland United States. I did learn that the Japanese got pretty close to California actually. I think they were in like San Francisco Bay and then they just like their, their mission fizzled out. They couldn't complete it and uh, this one is going to be on the east coast. Apparently was under some threat of U-boats. It was very, very br briefly touched upon in the World at War, which we watched over on Patreon, which by the way, you'll find the link to that in the description and pinned comment if you're interested in going and checking out that. 26 episodes, each of them are, are an hour long um, on World War II. Not something I can do over here on uh, YouTube, so we did it over on Patreon. And I got a lot of other stuff over there too as well. So I'm looking forward to this, learning a little bit more about this. Don't know much about it, so let's check it out. <laughs> It was called Paukenschlag, or drumbeat in English, the German operation to extend the U-boat war to the very shores of the United States. When Hitler declared war on the US on the 11th of December 1941, following Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor on the 7th, the Germans decided that it was time to extend the U-boat war west, where defenses were ill-prepared and patchy and hunting opportunities numerous. Since the outbreak of war in September 1939, German U-boats have been trying to starve Great Britain into submission by sinking the merchant ships, bringing the beleaguered nation food, raw materials, weapons, and many other essentials from the United States and Canada, and from certain South American countries, particularly Argentina. If Hitler mm. could sever Britain's transatlantic trade, the nation's resistance to him would collapse. The initial successes had begun to fade, as the Royal Navy rapidly developed anti-submarine forces and better convoy protection in the eastern half of the Atlantic. But to attack the Allied supply ships at or near to source along the US and Canadian eastern seaboards where defences were weak could yet break Britain's resolve, and so Operation Drumbeat was formulated and put into action. It would also demonstrate to the Americans the long reach of Hitler, able to send U-boats right to the shores of the United States. Mm. From January 1942, German U-boatmen would experience what they called the second happy time, the first being the slaughter of merchant ships at the start of the war in Europe, happy time. as long-range U-boats prowled the North American eastern coasts, sinking virtually at will an astounding 609 ships, oh totaling gosh. just over 3 million tons, for the eventual loss of just 22 U-boats. I think uh, they, they uh, said those numbers in the World at War, but I had forgotten about it. It's good night. That's a lot, it's a lot of damage. Due to the parlous state of U.S. defenses, U-boats became very bold and came close inshore. In one famous case, actually right up to New York Harbor to torpedo and sink ships within sight of the skyscrapers of Manhattan. That's creepy. This is the story of how a German U-boat came within touching distance of America's biggest city in a bold and skillful display of seamanship. It's creepy to think that there's like German boats right there on the coast. For the first phase of drumbeat, 
the head of the U-boat service, Admiral Karl Dernitz, could only spare five long-range submarines, as his forces were already fully engaged in the eastern and mid-Atlantic on anti-convoy duties. Among the five boats which left Europe on the 23rd of December 1941 for America was the Type 9B U-123. One of the largest U-boat types, 194 examples would be completed during the war. The 9B was 251 feet, or 76.5 metres in length, displacing 1,051 tonnes, with a range of 14,000 miles, or 22,000 kilometres. Look at how narrow it is, though. <laughs> like, it's a length of two guys, basically, maybe three. That's not very wide. I'd like to see the inside of one of these and just see how cramped it was. It's pretty long, but still, like, I would feel very... I feel claustrophobic in a submarine anyway, but especially one that that's that narrow. And a crew of 48, perfect for American operations. Armed with six torpedo tubes, four in the bow and two in the stern, U-123 was loaded with 22 torpedoes and also had a 10.5 centimeter naval gun for surface actions, as well as 20 and 37 millimeter flak cannons for anti-aircraft defense. In command was an officer who would become a U-boat legend. I didn't realize submarines had cannons on them. <laughs> I thought they would just have like underwater um, weapons, I guess. Kapitän Leutnant Reinhard Hardigan. He had been in action since September 1939, previously serving as watch officer aboard U-124 and then as captain of the U-147 off the Scottish coast, where he had successfully sunk a Norwegian freighter. U-123 had already made several war patrols before Hardigan took over in May 1941. Patrolling off West Africa, Hardigan had sunk a neutral Portuguese freighter and in October 1941, torpedoed and damaged the British auxiliary cruiser HMS Urania. For his patrol to America, Hardigan was ordered to take U-123 close inshore and penetrate the area around New York City, where large numbers of Allied merchant ships should be. Due to secrecy, the Kriegsmarine had no up-to-date maps of the area, Hardigan having to rely on his nautical charts and a pocket atlas being ignorant of U.S. defences. Hardigan Jeez. was also not a well man, still suffering the effects of an air crash from 1936, as he had originally started out as a naval aviator before transferring to the U-boat branch. He had a shortened leg and chronic bleeding of the stomach that necessitated a special diet, but Hardigan was determined to take U-123 into action once again. By the 12th of January 1942, Hardigan had his boat 125 miles southeast of Cape Sable, Nova Scotia, when he attacked the Holt & Company steamship SS Cyclops, an old ship that had remarkably survived two torpedo attacks in World War I. Well. Hardigan slammed a G-7A torpedo into her starboard side. The crew began to abandon ship, and 29 minutes later, Hardigan fired again, this time sinking the Cyclops. 46 passengers and one army gunner manning the ship's defensive weapons died. The rest of the crew was saved. Hardigan there's, just, there's just something weird about the Cyclops, Cyclops name that it kind of, like, freaks me out a little bit. I don't know. Like, I feel like that's just a... I wouldn't want to be on that ship. <laughs> Our approach New York. Operation Drumbeat commenced officially on the 13th of January 1942, with all five U-boats beginning attacks along the American coast. Motoring on the surface, U-123 moved towards New York City. Hardigan was delighted to discover that the Montauk Point Lighthouse at the tip of Long Island was still operational on the 13th of January providing an excellent navigational beacon. Through powerful optics atop the Conning Tower Bridge, Hardigan and his officers could see many towns and settlements ashore fully lit up. Even car headlights could be discerned moving along coast roads. I mean, so they're just like coming into the area above water, like they're not even trying to hide at this point, is that right? <laughs> I mean, the gumption you have to have to do that. Also, I don't think our defense, I mean, obviously, I think we've beefed up our defenses a little bit, I would hope, from this, but <laughs> this is crazy that somebody could get this close to the US. All this light provided a perfect backdrop to illuminate ships at sea to be targeted by the U-boats. 
At a point about 60 miles off Montauk Point, Hardigan came upon the Norness, a Panamanian registered motor tanker. On the 14th of January at 0834 hours, Hardigan slammed a torpedo into the tanker. A second struck the ship at 0853, finishing her off, some 39 survivors being picked up by US warships and a fishing boat. <clears throat> Later, on the evening of the 14th of January, Hardigan was close enough to New York to see the glare of Manhattan's skyscrapers in the distance. He later said, I cannot describe the feeling with words, but it was unbelievably beautiful and great. I would have given away a kingdom for this moment if I had one. We were the first to be here, and for the first time in this war, a German soldier looked upon the coast of the USA. A photographer aboard U-123 tried to get very good nighttime shots of Manhattan and also film, but it proved difficult as the lighting conditions were far from perfect. Is that the actual film right there? If so, that's doubly creepy. Later propaganda films shown in Germany of this momentous event used images that were faked with carefully lit models. Never mind. But the effect was very close to what Hardigan and his crew could actually see. Incredibly, Hardigan had actually visited New York City in 1933 as a naval cadet and climbed to the top of the Empire State Building. Now he was seeing these very buildings from the other side out at sea. Hardigan briefly considered entering New York Harbor to attack ships lying at anchor, but decided against this because of his lack of accurate charts. His U-boat could easily have been cornered and attacked in the harbor's shallow waters. Turning away reluctantly from the bright lights of Manhattan, U-123 motored away on the surface, again unthreatened by U.S. retaliation. The next day, U-123 struck again. A 0941 on the 15th of January, Hardigan attacked the unescorted British steam tanker Coimbra, 27 miles off the Hamptons on Long Island. The torpedo caused a massive explosion as the oil tanks blew up, clearly visible ashore. The tanker sank into shallow waters in just five minutes. Hardegan became bolder, next torpedoing the freighter San Jose only a thousand yards from the Coast Guard base at Atlantic City, New Jersey. By the night of the 19th of January, U-123 was off Cape Hatteras and would sink three more ships before heading back to base at Lorient in France. What? Did the U.S. not have any sort of, like, defense? Like, were they... What did they... Do? What was the U.S. response to this? Did they just not have one? This is kind of what it sounds like. Or did they just not have a way to find the U-boat and defend... I, I don't know. Like, seems like nothing's being done, but uh, I don't know. In a second war patrol to Florida, Hardigan successfully sank several more Florida? ships, earning him the Knight's Cross and Oak Leaves for these two operations, what? and also gaining him a congratulatory dinner with Adolf Hitler, during which Hardigan rather soiled his copybook by reprimanding Hitler for not forming a proper naval aviation branch like the Allies had. As a result of the first attacks of Operation Drumbeat, the U.S. Navy instituted convoys in U.S. waters. The U.S. Army ordered that coastal lights be doused or shielded to prevent U-boat commanders from using them to silhouette merchant ships to aid their attacks. Times Square was given a dim out, that is, the famous advertising neon was switched off. After okay, I am recalling some of this that he's talking about now in the World of War. They did talk about it briefly, or the people in the comments on Patreon pointed some of this stuff out too that there were kind of like some blackouts similar to what britain did um during the war not quite to that extent though so the u.s apparently did respond just <laughs> too a little too late a series of training and staff appointments ashore hardigan ended up as a ground commander in 1945 in charge of a battalion of sailors fighting as soldiers during the final battles after the war hardigan was a politician for over 30 years Reinhard Hardigan died in June 2018. He was 105 years wow, old. Wow, he lived a long time. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share. Also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. All right, well, that definitely did go into a lot more detail than the World at War did um, with, with all of this stuff. I can't believe how many boats they sunk. You know, obviously they sunk way more, 600 something. 
uh, a little bit closer to Europe. But the the fact that they that, that there was like a, a German German boats like right by New York City is just is is very like I said I don't know what how else to explain it other than creepy that have it to have an enemy on your shore like that of course a lot of you in Europe are like yeah what's new like that's you're used to that <laughs> we're here in the states we're not we're not used to that at all like it's really really unsettling thinking that our enemy is that close to us. Even though I know that sometimes they like infiltrate society, obviously the hijackers in 9-11 was a huge kind of blow to our national defense because it was from the uh, inside instead of, you know, a, what you would think is a typical attack or an invasion. But still, it's, it's pretty nuts to think about the US was like that close to actually being attacked. Like, you know, if they had submarines like they do today that could actually shoot bombs from underwater, you know, I would imagine Germany might have actually tried to hit parts of New York City. Maybe Japan would have done that to California too. I don't know. But yeah, that was crazy. That was crazy. And it's definitely a lot more to that story that might be interesting to uh, learn about. So thank you, Steven, for recommending this uh, video to me. Hope you guys liked it too. Make sure to comment down below if you want to answer my questions or anything. Also make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't done that yet. Check out all the links to my social media, Patreon, Star Trek podcast, all of that stuff in the description and pinned comment. Roger Scarlet and I thank you guys for watching. We'll see you down the road. We'll do more uh, stuff on the Navy, more military videos because you guys know I love those. So I don't know what they do to say goodbye in the Navy, but you know, uh, is it Bon Voyage? Maybe, I don't know. Bon Voyage.